Ocean Hour! Another exciting day in March. The clickety clack logos, the wonderful world of analog devices, and our website, tortukanwordpress.com, which has a bunch of stuff on it, freebies. Everybody can share those. Okie doke. Um, as usual, we are plowing through the source analysis of a creationist book to find out what the hell's going on in it because um, they don't always give the details like a master bibliography. This one, of course, is Titans, the dinosaur book. Not gigantic, not badly illustrated per se, and basically parasitizing the material from the regular sciences, as we shall be discovering. I mentioned last week how... Um, uh, they're kind of vague about their kinds, and they're denying their own argument about um, the... Um, uh, oh, I'm going to put my little chat window up there in case anybody shows up. We'll find out who all arrives or not, as the case may be. The signal seems to be reasonably good. Um, now we at last are into a technical source, and uh, it has to do, oddly enough, with non-theropods. Um, along the way, mentions this Acrocanthosaurus and that it was apparently munching on a Sonorosaurus, which is a Brachiosaur, a smaller size Brachiosaur. And so he cites, uh, they cite a 1998 paper on that particular taxon. It's from Texas. Paper itself is not open access, but the upshot of it is that they are describing the taphonomy details about uh, the circumstances of the kind of river estuary that the bones were being found in and the like, which don't sound very much like the big slosh. Uh, well, science did not stop in 1998. And there are quite a few technical papers on that particular taxon and the relationship of Brachiosaurs and Titanosaurid group, which even the creationists, as I gave a little peek, uh, spoiler alert, I peeked ahead on the chapter on sauropods to see what they were going to say about the Sonorosaurus, and they can't quite make up their mind what the size of the kind is, exactly reflecting the eccentricities of trying to do. Hello, Vesta. Good morning, early morning. Um, so we've got a paper from 2012 from Demick uh, on the early evolution of titanosaur forms, and another one from 2016. Uh, this is the uh, 2012 one, the early evolution, which I'll be putting a link up to because that one's open access. And then a, a 2016 paper on anatomy, systematics, and the paleo environment and growth patterns of the groups. You'll be able to check out the systematics and you'll be able to discover how uh, pretty stable uh, a lot of the elements are. Uh, one of the papers that um, I'll be putting into as well from... A couple from uh, a man in from 2017 and another one from 2019. Uh, the one from 2017 is also fairly typical because it goes into the details on uh, the paleogeography of where the continents were and the systematics and the chronology and all of that. Um, and uh, the 2019 paper, a really long little mother. Uh, going into all the different systematic things and analyzing the bone structures and all the little bits that make up a, a thorough understanding of um, what uh, is being done for classification. Um, all of that's like light years removed <laughs> from what you're getting in the little cartoon uh, in uh, the Sarfadian table. Um, the part two of the show relates to an old post that I uncovered. Uh, Michael Ord, um, who is the kind of point guy in creationism for the um, uh, effort to cram everything that relates to ice ages into the ice age, which they proposed took place kind of after the flood, uh, sometime before the Tower of Babel. Uh, they're not, not entirely ridiculously detailed on it. But this particular one that came up um, ice core oscillations in the part four, abrupt changes better explained by the ice age, I thought was kind of interesting because along the way, uh, it alludes to um, the younger, driest climate issue. Now, as it happens, we're going to have oodles on it in volume two of the rocks were there because it's knee deep in the time frame 
that's relevant to the Black Sea flooding and the climate shifts that are going on. And there's movements of people and shifting of farming cultures into Europe. And there's a whole mammoth amount of stuff that's going on of which none of that can really be <laughs> down into the incredibly compact cartoon uh, that is creationism. But they um, uh, referred to a paper from Baldini, which I will be able to put up as an open access. There was also kind of a back and forth that went on about it um, in uh, um, criticism of uh, whether or not this particular eruption of the um, Locker Sea volcano uh, was early or late in the field of it. A little, a peculiar little scholarly note popped up along the way, though, because I noticed that Ord uh, was arguing that, a, a, quote, Kletechka et al. don't think this eruption was significant. Besides, they claimed it may have erupted before the YD, the Younger Dryas. Who the hell is Kletechka? <laughs> um, maybe somebody can spot it in his references somehow, but I can't find any paper by Kletechka or one where Kletechka is mentioned in any of the, the uh, authors. So who knows? Uh, maybe my eyeballs were just glazed over because I can't, I couldn't spot them. Um, anyway, a redate of the locker eruption in 2021 suggested the volcano actually did occur just slightly before uh, the um, Younger Dryas, which incidentally, most of the arguments for the Younger Dryas involve um, uh, the thermal currents in the oceans getting disrupted as fresh water is rippling down from these melting glaciers that are, are upsetting the, the saline balance in the oceans, and that can plummet things into a, uh, a cold snap, which is what happened in the Younger Dryas. Um, there's also a sidebar, which is why it's going to be discussed in a neat set of uh, info boxes in the new book, because there's a, a small group of um, geochronologists and geologists uh, in a camp that argues <coughs> that um, <coughs> the Younger Dryas was actually triggered by a boloid impact. And this has been going on in a, as a ping pong match between these camps, largely in the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, but sometimes outside of that for like since 2008. And every, every so often a new installment of this continuous thing goes on. It's absolutely hilarious. Uh, oh, oh, absolutely. Yes, yes, the um, uh, the org standard creationism, and this is a dogma at AIG, ICR, and CMI. I don't know of any exceptions to it, is there can only be one ice age. And so all glaciation that takes place prior to um, the um, Pleistocene ice age, which is the one that they're basically dealing with, can't be right. Or it's actually current. But since so many of this Ice Age material can be related to stuff that's going on in the Silurian period and when continents were shifted around and, and uh, Africa was down by the pole and all that kind of stuff, um, that um, and Precambrian ones as well, Precambrian Ice Age uh, uh, data, uh, let alone the giant snowball Earth, uh, none of that can be true in the model because Precambrian stuff is pre-flood. So there can't be anything going on in that context. And so they've, they've just got a pirouette all over the place. There's not a huge amount of apologetics on it. Ord is one of them. And there's a couple other people that get into this Hebert uh, and um, uh, the like can kind of get involved with it. You have these articles popping up just kind of like regular clockwork, banging the drum and they have to deactivate the notion of ice cores and all that other stuff, which of course relates basically to more recent data on the Pleistocene uh, uh, glaciation phase as ice comes and goes and so forth and so on. To be honest, um, all of this argument has carried zero weight in the actual uh, paleogeology community as they're working out all the little fiddly bits about what's going on and what lobes are going where and what kind of drainage patterns are occurring where and what fauna existing and what kind of flora that are existing in particular spots at particular times. And um, um, all you can get is kind of a superficial cartoon, which is why uh, anybody that, that, that wants to uh, just dive into it can take this Ord piece and follow up on the technical literature, kind of like the same way I did, um, because um, 
part of the, the scholarly bit that I'm doing in my tip project, another reason to be a patron of the project, because nobody else is doing this, um, is to look into their source material. So I will go through, and you can see my little hand scratchings, as I track down every technical paper that was not already in my system to intrude. That's why I was discovering who the hell is uh, um, Kratechka. Yeah, so just ignore the huge snowman in the room. Yeah, yeah. The um, uh, the only minor debate that, that still is ongoing uh, in the Snowball Earth model is, was there a complete ice over the planet or were there little spots that we still had volcanoes poking up and a few little spots like that? And there's still a little bit of a background uh, quibble on that. But nonetheless, the overall presence, I think, it, I can't remember whether it's called the Maranoian glaciation or something is a technical term for all of this stuff. And I typically don't keep it uh, plucked down in my head. But nevertheless, uh, it's very relevant to the idea of what bacteria and multicellular organisms were doing. And then what notions about when the snowball finally breaks and how much does that alter as you get more energy popping down into the ocean systems and what is that doing uh, and the, the uh, increasing uh, oxygenation of the atmosphere. There's a whole bunch of things about what's happening with the development of metazoan organisms and the things that's leading up to the Ediacar period and then into the Cambrian explosion. So it's not a trivial thing in terms of, of working out ancient biology and what the heck is going on in so many different environments. But all of that invariably has to be off the creation of scope because they don't allow any glaciation to be happening at that time. Uh, and so all the material that we can find, I think there were a bunch of glaciation things that were going on during the Ordovician. Um, you had um, during the, uh, the Permian period, you had some uh, glaciers down on the pole, South Pole uh, at that place. So you have just scads of information that's available all through hundreds and hundreds of millions of years. And, and, and this is relevant as well for people doing paleoclimate work and climatology today, because since we can't, or rather, we can only observe the effects of what we're doing to the environment with the CO2 and the like that we're pumping into it. But how can we tell what the dynamics of those will be? Well, one of the ways is to look at how climate has operated prior to human beings with CO2 and various uh, things that are going on that relate also, you have to work these things out for improving the models in relation to how the continents are distributed and therefore what kind of ocean currents are happening because the oceans are in a different configuration. You have a, a giant Tethys Sea spreading in, in that area from uh, what would eventually become India all the way through most of Europe. And that was just kind of an archipelago of islands. So you have a whole complex uh, the Neobar Seaway that went north to south through the middle of uh, North America. Uh, you, so you have uh, circulation patterns that are very different from the way we have things in the modern world that paleoclimate models have to take account to account for in a way when they can model those paleoclimates reasonably based upon the inferences that they can come up with them, oxygen balances and what plants are living where and so forth and so on. That helps them to improve the way that they're calibrating the models for what we can deal with with the cycling of what's going on in the modern world. So this is not an abstract uh, um, issue just for people who are um, loving ancient continental distribution, um, although that's enough on its own, but it also has some implications for modern climatology research. So it's um, it's a little funky one to go on in there. Um, the, the younger Dryas, I was surprised at how much information just keeps cascading into it. Because that period roughly from about 12,000 years ago down to about eight or 9,000 after it, it's the, the younger dries and the aftermath of all of this as the climate recalibrates and gets into the mode that we're more familiar with uh, as the ice age finally pulls back and uh, uh, everything kind of warms up. Um, huge amounts of things in terms of, of population. Of course, the Americas get settled uh, with a vengeance. Uh, in that period that's just before the Younger Dryas. Uh, and so you got a lot of stuff that's going on in a lot of different areas. And now, of course, we've got increasing amount of genetic data that we're going to be citing in the new book um, about um, working with the um, Neolithic communities that are in that period and their culture, the kind of monuments that some of them are building. There's all these little subcultures of things as to certain kind of stone monument structures that have been analyzed. And, and, and so it all forms this ever richer picture of many, many thousands of years of time, which is the time separating us from uh, Queen Hat Shepsut of Egypt. 
Uh, it's a big sprawl of chronology. And all of that stuff has to be either ignored or um, uh, compressed <coughs> into that hyper rapid creationist model. And needless to say, um, they start tripping over the details. So we're going to be discussing all sorts of examples of particular settlements and particular data involving archaeological finds that I can't figure out how that could possibly be compacted into any flood dispersal model. And no creationist even tries to do that. Uh, and we'll also be talking about the obsessions that they continue to have about uh, oh, uh, um, connections with uh, ancient Britons. Uh, there's a whole little sub block of creationists that are just obsessed with working out who the Irish kings were and all of this in his medieval lists and stuff. There's it, 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 Some of his stuff sounds like the kind of claptrap that was being done in the 19th century, because effectively it is the same claptrap that was being done in the 19th century, just dressed up in newer, newer postings, but none of it's changed a lot. Um, and um, it's also in relation to uh, a discussion of the Black Sea flood uh, hypothesis, which is fairly dicey uh, as an overall explanation for the Noah story. There's still tantalizing little clues that suggest that elements of it probably got filtered, folded into uh, some of the lore, but not all that spectacularly. And there are various areas where overall, of course, as the sea levels ro rose after the Ice Age, a lot of places got settled, uh, uh, flooded. Uh, so uh, the, the Dogger Banks uh, in the North Sea and, the, and uh, over in the Baltic um, and uh, the uh, um, uh, Strait of Gibraltar um, uh, got uh, opened up and uh, water was there rather than uh, uh, land. And so all sorts of people would be living in spots. Even you get a little sidebar of it with you, Ross, thinking that Eden is somewhere down in maybe what's now the Persian Gulf. Uh, but he's got an, his own little oddball. Uh, views of when the flood is happening. It, it's somewhere, I think I mentioned it in an earlier show indeed, that it's somewhere from like say 90,000 down to maybe you know, 50,000. <laughs> it's just a really big <laughs> uh, ballpark. Um, and and uh, Ross's latest hobby horse is that he's obsessed with the idea that it was a global flood in that every human being was living in an area that's small enough that it could be flooded all at once. I don't know how he's going to try to make an argument like that, <laughs> given what we know about the dispersal of human beings and the various cultures that are around and what the time frames and stuff are and all that. And, 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 Gosh, they're in Australia and Asia and all that. But the poor Australians get left out of this. Well, amazingly, the Australians get left out so much by Australian creationists. Uh, Andrew Snelling and Taz Walker and all of that. So many of these people come from that Australian background and Ken Ham. And yet that continent is just, they, they give it the thumb of the nose. The Aborigines don't get any uh, um, say at all in, in the same way that the Americas get given short shrift, except when they try to find uh, legends of Noah's Ark in the uh, supposed uh, Indian tales. And that also is going to be discussed in detail in volume two. There's going to be a whole appendix on it. It started out as a uh, info box, but that info box started to expand to the point where I suddenly went, oh, yike, yeah, I got to make an appendix. Uh, so it's going to be a fun little bit, which will catalog um, the big highlights of the various flood legends around places and how creationists have dealt with them and how creationists deal with certain cultures at the preference over others and rely upon very sketchy historical information. And they don't really pay a hell of a lot of attention to more recent scholarship in the area. And there's been a, an amazing amount uh, of it. So we're going to have a lot of fun in, in addition to the weird crazy eights argument uh, about uh, supposedly um, the Chinese language is actually a riff off of the Genesis account, literally by the way they construct their pictograms. And there's a whole little subculture on that. Um, oh yeah, the, the, the Egyptian, this is a great time to be dealing that with uh, Egypt because we have gotten an awful lot clarified um, in just the past 10 or 20 years. There's ongoing archeology span obviously going on in the area. And so much now in terms of what the Nile was like during the pharaonic times, how much greener it was at the time the pyramids were built, if the place wasn't as arid as we're used to. Uh, and of course, all cultures also that's spreading out into, into the gradually desertifying Sahara 
um, there's a whole pile up of interesting scholarship that's going on in here. And some of this stuff has come up um, particularly in very arid areas by using LIDAR and satellite imagery, which is able to locate spots that are buried underneath sand that can then be excavated in a way that uh, is going to be ongoing. In the same way that they can penetrate through jungles. And so uh, the areas that are seen in uh, the uh, settlements in the Amazonian region that they hadn't recognized uh, before and, and the extent of the Maya city-states and how large their suburbs were, uh, all of this is, is expanding enormously. And there's going to be archaeology up the yin-yang on all of that stuff. Um, we uh, have a, a much more extensive um, number of Egyptian tombs that have been uh, excavated and ongoing excavations uh, in this period. And we'll be alluding to it in the uh, book about the um, fact that we now know so much more about the building of the pyramids that everybody, even up to the 1980s, uh, was running off part empty. Uh, but now we know about how, where they're getting the, the stones from. We know the, where the uh, uh, workmen lived. Uh, they had huge settlements that got eventually buried in because the big rampways that were used to, to uh, haul stones up into the uh, pyramid construction. Once that's done, what do you do with the sand? Well, the workers aren't needed anymore. You just move them out and dump all the sand in that spot, smooth it out like a nice sand garden so that it looks all pretty and uh, finish off the pyramid with a nice gleaming white marble and the little gold pyramid eating on the top. And there, the pharaoh will rest for eternity yeah, until they rob the place, uh, which happened pretty quickly. Um, whenever you would have breakdown in uh, culture, you would then have um, the obvious need to just ransack those damn pyramids for all the golden crap in there. And that's why there's, there's really nothing other... Um, uh, I, I suspect one of the reasons why the Great Pyramid uh, seems to have no inscriptions at all, it's because it was all probably done in splendiferous gold and all that's gotten taken away. So um, it was like plating up on the walls. Um, the closest we can see to really having an idea of what a, a tomb looked like is when they moved over into the... Um, New Kingdom in the Valley of the Kings and, and squirreled them away in burrows in the mountainside which they hoped to keep secret so it was like a guild but even there um as uh, the uh, archaeologist romer did a really neat series on bbc back in the 80s and that ancient lives i think it's called um on the uh, uh archives that they found in the, the settlement which which really went through there was a whole mass of letters and things they had back and forth that opened up the window of what was actually going on in the tomb builder community and how there were times when economic times got bad, and so people were starting to rob the tombs, and the police would effect have to come in and scurry up and arrest people and do all sorts of fun stuff that was going on. And um, that, of course, the, the New Kingdom period, that's post-Exodus times, you know, you're the uh, Tutankhamun period, we're talking about uh, 14, 15, 15, 13, 14, 13, 1200, around in that period, uh, which is um, you know, a thousand years or more. Uh, after the Great Big Pyramid building age. So it's always a reminder how unnervingly long Egyptian culture is, is that the pyramids were older to Cleopatra than Cleopatra is to us. <laughs> so that, 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 that's, that's a, a, a schedule. And we also are learning increasingly things about the pre-dynastic period before you get into the Pharaoh list. Yeah, it started about 6,000 BC and then about 2,000 BC. Surprise, surprise, no mention of Noah's flood. Yes, that, that's another little detail that we will be making a big deal about and that the creationists are very tiptoey around um, is that um, the Egyptians have no flood legend and certainly don't seem to be noticing the flood. So for many, many years, I was expecting a thing to happen, which now in a little niche group of creationists is happening. And that is, since the Egyptian chronology straddles the flood, what you have to do, you put little rollers underneath it and it, 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 move the entire chronology down past the flood. Easy peasy, isn't it? That's not a problem. But that also includes all the pre-dynastic stuff. So they got to move the whole shebang. And all of this then has to be moved down so that all of the Egyptian culture 
can be that of Noah's descendants after the flood. Well, now you're facing the reverse problem. Hebrews are coming in. Supposedly their language will be uh, um, tweaked at Babel, and so they wouldn't be speaking Hebrew anymore. But they would they not remember what had happened? I mean, they were all just, you know, a few generations after the flood. So they knew about Noah and all of this stuff. And yet, as they build, lickety split this giant civilization, including the pyramids and all this other stuff, all compressed in time. This is after 2350 BCE. All of this has got to take place. Meanwhile, mastodons are materializing and going extinct, according to Andrew Snelling. And Ice Age is going on. up in the, All of this is happening at once, remember. Um, that uh, um, the Egyptians somehow culture and a writing and, and mythology that has no connection whatsoever to the stuff that, that's relating to the Bible. It's not biblical. It's all completely independent. So they're, they're, it doesn't actually help their case any to just pull everything down. It just adds another layer of problem as they try to figure out how all of this stuff can happen all in such a compressed time frame. Now, it's not a huge number of creationists that are doing the heavy hauling here. Uh, there's a guy down and a couple people around in that little network and just a handful of apologists that cite him, Bates and a few others, that uh, cite that little bunch. It's a very incestuous little group that's uh, largely at CMI and then there's little bits of it at AIG and ICR. Um, it'll be funky to see how far they can think to press all of this. Uh, and then if you try to juggle the, the chronology too much, now you're faced with the difficulty that you start seeing interconnections between the Egyptians and their neighbors. Um, when you're talking about Akhenaten, the famous uh, Amarna archives, is diplomatic correspondence going on with the Hittites and all these other little people. And so there's just, there's all these little interconnections. So it's just like trying to argue what happens if you try to arbitrarily push the civil war into the 20th century what, what, are you having somebody in 1915 writing a letter to Queen Victoria? Well, don't you now have to move the British history down too? And all of that's in a mess. And the fact that there's such a huge weight of material on the Babylonians and the, the well, in fact, there's a whole bunch of different cultures in, in the Mesopotamian region. And then, of course, contemporaneously, we have all of the, the scholarship on the Chinese culture. Their roots go back just as far as the Egyptians do. Uh, and um, it's just a hilarious mess to try to figure out how they're going to do that. And I, I, I'm not anticipating that they're ever going to get it resolved, but it, it'll be a little niche apologetics going on there every once in a while. Uh, the more people allude to it in the same way that we do the heat issue or uh, some of the other problems that cre uh, creationism has in the uh, physical realm, um, the more they'll have to kind of force themselves into it. But It'll operation to deal with. Uh, we'll be alluding in the new book as well to a, a lot of the archaeological sites uh, like um, Stonehenge and, uh, and then of course because of the, the um, idiots that think that there's stegos culture in the Middle Ages uh, that um, that stuff comes up. Uh, Cattle Huliak, uh, um, the really really old um, settlement, one of the first uh, towns uh, in uh, known in the chronology. Uh, all of that stuff involves the need to recalibrate it in their creationist framework. And so the rare instances of when they try to, they just haul ass and pull it down past the flood uh, to avoid it. So anyway, um, uh, that's part of the material that's going to be uh, in there uh, because the, the big slosh spills across so many dynamic boundaries um, on uh, figuring out biogeography of animals and how you're getting them to and from the ark, uh, figuring out the physical features of the ark. Can it withstand uh, the conditions that are in the big slosh uh, and uh, uh, the various uh, work out to try to figure out how the thing was constructed? And of course, you've got the Ark Encounter, and you have John Woodmarap's feasibility study, and there's a, a bunch of create, uh, a Korean uh, boat people that were uh, figuring out uh, ways that the Ark could float properly, and you've got uh, a bunch of different sidebars in this area, and hopefully we'll be the first book that's pulled all of this little minutiae together. Um, oh, yes, yeah, the, the, 
it's not merely that the Nile flooding that they kept records of, and when the it was when the Nile didn't flood that sh shit breaks out. Uh, the 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 dynasties collapse. There's starvation in the land. So the failure of the Nile to flood on schedule it was disastrous. And if there was any climate blips to where uh, the water coming downstream wasn't bringing in all that silt uh, the way they needed to do it, um, so the, the whole dynasty breaks down. And that's the reason why the old kingdom stops and there's the middle kingdom. And the middle kingdom also, all of these things, as I recall, uh, are basically nicked off by climatological circumstances that finally run the thing. The, the, the Egyptians are perfectly capable of running a dynasty on for centuries uh, until climate shit happens and things aren't working out well. Um, flooding, therefore, in Egypt was exactly the opposite of what was going on in China, on the Yangtze, and in uh, Mesopotamia with the Tigris Euphrates, where flooding um, was a mess. Um, if you put something on a boat and raise the water, it raises the thing on the boat. <laughs> yeah, indeed. Um, one of the things that's probably the case for the construction of the pyramids, when the Nile was in flood, you have a whole agricultural workforce that are just sitting on their hands. They can't do a damn thing until the flood's over. So part of the argument is, is that the pyramids were giant make work programs so that you would have all of that population that would be brought in they would also have to have the logistics of feeding everybody and all the rest, but keep them busy and build a, a pyramid to the God King. Um, and that process probably continued all the way down in different modalities, even after the pyramid age. Um, the um, giant stones, uh, the big granite blocks and the stuff and the things that were being done for uh, uh, giant obelisks and the like would have involved putting them on a boat um, and in the position that you that wait until the Nile floods and boop, lifts the thing up and now it's floatable and you can work it and move it to a new location next to where you want to do it. And then if necessary, have everything positioned. The only got to do is do the heave ho until the end, but you, they're, they're pretty damn good at that. The vast majority of the stones for the great pyramids, um, those all came on site. They were just excavating the adjacent land, carving them up into little two ton blocks uh, that were manageable and all that. Uh, didn't know Hoover was an Egyptian. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. A few back-to-back uh, -back years of poor floods had a huge impact. In, in, uh, and they can track a lot of this stuff. There's um, groupings. Um, um, the, I'm trying to figure of the bloody date. I um, uh, can't remember. There was like uh, 1200 BC or, or uh, 2200, one of those, um, that there was a period in which there was just a giant climate blip that happened. And it had effects all over the place. Um, this is long after the Younger Dryas. Uh, this is uh, in a much more recent time frame. But you get these things that that destroyed uh, uh, cultures in the, in Sumeria. Uh, there were, um, yeah, I think it was like 2300 BC. Uh, uh, curiously enough, kind of around in the time that the flood is supposed to happen, but it involves drought, not flood. And um, uh, the Harappa culture uh, that had a very burgeoning trade network. Uh, there's another piece of culture that that we, we uh, last don't have written records because they had a written language, but only tiny fragments have survived and we can't read most of it. So there's only just the tiniest fragment of stuff that they've kind of done puzzled. It, it definitely has the structure of a language. Uh, they've been able to work out mathematical modelings of that, but what exactly was going on, we don't have enough things to be able to do it. And we don't have the equivalent of Rosetta Stone to be able to clarify a lot of that. But anyway, um, the Harappa culture had interconnections with a whole bunch of their neighbors, big trade networks across the Arabian Gulf and all that. We do know about that. Uh, and all that got flattened uh, during the thing when droughts were taking place. And there were also, you could have, in, depending on circumstances, you could have some spots that were getting too much rain and in other areas where you're not getting enough in the same way that we can see uh, uh, droughts occurring in certain contexts and fires at the same time, torrential rains are happening in other parts of the country. Um, those things can happen in natural climate cycles. And um, some of it can be uh, aggravated by volcanic eruptions clear on the other side of the planet. Uh, and, uh, and other things can be much longer cyc cyclic things that are going on in terms of 
uh, land displacement as, as the ice age ends and land is being gradually pushed up and that's changing the sea balance and the dra river drainage all very slowly over long periods of time. It's a bunch of stuff that can go on. So anyway, uh, 2300 BCE, yeah, that's that's the one that um, uh, kicked off. But there have been other, other climate blips, um, uh, things that took place to um, uh, flatten the Mycenaean culture uh, and uh, Troy and other areas around 1200 BC, you know, so um, uh, you could argue that on a cyclic basis, a lot of these things would be happening, um, you know, every thousand, two thousand years or so. Um, and you find uh, things that happen all with a perfectly natural cyclical system. And so you have the thing where you have the medieval warming period. Uh, and so things are happening there. And then suddenly it starts getting really cold again uh, in the uh, Renaissance. And so passes uh, that used to be open uh, are closed up again. These things have happened over and over and over again in, in, in uh, cycles. How much of it is due to larger trigger factors that's going on in monsoon systems and uh, ocean circulation with stuff clear out in the Pacific Ocean with La Nina, El Nina cycles. There's a whole bunch of things. And that's the part of the reason why paleoclimate research is so relevant to try to figure out what's going on in earlier periods with very different configurations, as well as to be able to model things that are happening much more recently. So isn't that fun? Yeah. So uh, there will be a lot on the um, uh, archaeology end of a lot of stuff in the new book. Uh, in addition to all the linguistic stuff. And then we'll be going all the way down into the Middle Ages and into the Renaissance because uh, there's a whole subsection of creationists that are arguing that dinosaurs survived into a time when medieval people could even see them. And there's even a couple creationists that argue that Leonardo da Vinci actually drew pictures of living dinosaurs. No. <laughs> and and th this was an argument that's so hilariously wrong because unfortunately, da Vinci actually wrote about how he came up with the little designs. If somebody wanted to have a dragon on a, uh, a manuscript or a painting, well, he was happy to oblige and he explained how he would concoct what pieces of cats that he would use and what pieces of, of uh, lions and whatever that he would make use of uh, in order to create the, the concoction of what would please the client. Uh, and then you had a um, Renaissance um, guy uh, over in France who was just obsessed with salamanders. And so those little elements got in there and a bunch of creationists come along and take a look at, at a few of these things and decide, no, they're actually dinosaurs or, or um, uh, synapsid uh, uh, reptile mammal uh, bunch even. It's, it's wacky. Uh, it's a relatively small number of people. And we'll also be having a cute little chart where we'll look at some of the favorite contenders of silliness and how different groups at AIG and CMI and ICR and then the and then the bottom feeders disagree about how, whether they think those are legit or not. So there's an awful lot of coordinated uh, material that we'll be piecing all together. So anyway, uh, that gets uh, most of that little material up to speed. And um, did it do, do, uh, I will want to have a not now on that. I get these little messages that pop up on the stupid. Um, uh, laptop, but uh, usually in the middle of a show where I'm going, bad, stop, don't, uh, at least it's a thing where I don't have to do the, um, this cognitive bias is strong. Yeah. It, and it, after all, I am after all a, a historian by trade. And so I love the historical background information on things and the, um, the lore about how it's a tale moves through the time frames and how legends are extrapolated and how particular things get dragged along farther down the road and how people connect up in ways that amaze you. The same idiot person shows up in one context as with another. So that um, some of the things that are relating to uh, a geological issue that's in creationism also connects up with the Shroud of Turin. And you've got just, just pile up of, of uh, cross connections that uh, have some of the same dramatic, some of the people involved in the um, that Younger Dryas impact argument are also linked up with the group that argue that there was another impact that's taking place that explains the Sodom and Gomorrah thing. And so you get just little background niche things, uh, some of whom are questionable reputations and some of their views probably will lead them to even more questionable reputations as we move farther on into the 21st century. We'll be seeing what's going on. But anyway, uh, the goal is to, to keep all of the material in the uh, new book as up to date as possible. Uh, we'll be angling for late 2024, early 2025. 
Um, I'm about halfway through the first phase of adjustment of um, Jackson's chapter on uh, Tiktaalik and a bunch of other stuff. There's going to be material in the Cambrian explosion. There's a lot of neat material in there. Stasis issues and the Wistar conference. There's a whole bunch of, of neat little uh, stuff in there. And so I'm folding my material in in my first pass as I'm getting all of his technical sources uh, plugged into the main uh, reference base. And then I have a big stack in the basement of stuff that I'd set aside on developmental issues and uh, formation of limb details and that, some of which I'm, I have already alluded to, presumably, uh, in what I've done in my first pass. But I'll that'll give me a cross check. So um, uh, what I see is a house of cards made of many decks. Yes, well, and, and the fun part is it's, from a scholarly and, and a humor point of view, it's that there are competing camps in creationism. It, it's never been quite the case that creationism was a monolith. Um, uh, you certainly had that Henry Morris era of um, uh, a small cadre that were circulating around the Institute for Creation Research and the Creation Research Society and that. And there was a lot of incestuous, and to some extent still is, a lot of incestuous cross fertilization fertilization. But most of the main lore was pretty constant. Um, it was only as time progressed that they got, um, so many of them got very wedded to the Bishop Usher 2348 BC uh, flood date, uh, even though you still find, and we're going to have a whole list of all the different uh, creationists who have varying dates of the Bible, uh, yes, the uh, small pyramid on the other side of it. And and um, uh, there the are way more pyramids than just the big ones at Giza. Of course, the earlier ones at Saqqara, uh, that was the first bunch. And uh, my favorite one is Doser, who managed to build not one, not two, but three pyramids during his life. You know, the, he, they kept on having problems. They had construction teething pains. They were The pyramid builders in that stage were the, were the Boeing Douglas, <laughs> McDonnell Douglas Boeing of, of um, pyramid constructions. They were just kind of learning it as they went and they had collapsing sides and, and stones that would be pressure and breaking from the weight of the stones on top of them and figuring out they needed to angle them. And so they, they by the time you get down to the big great pyramid in a different location, maybe they decided that they wanted something that would be um, uh, away from what granddad did with uh, the step pyramids and all that out in there in the desert and have something more located conveniently uh, for the um, uh, Nile usage. Uh, but then there were quite a lot of pyramids that were built after that. And uh, the Nubian dynasty, they their pyramids are relatively small and kind of pointy uh, compared to the shallower thing and much smaller. But still the pyramid building mania um, kept along as the status symbol uh, for a very, very long time. And then finally, as you move into the New Kingdom times, that's gone. And um, they now uh, built um, ex ever expanding versions at Luxor and all that. And of course, Akhenaton with his great city uh, that was built for a while. They've got the foundations of the bloody thing, but all of that got dismantled when the uh, Pharaoh died and uh, King Tut restored the old ways of doing things and out with the Aten and all of that. So a lot of stuff that's going on in there. And um, as much as I would want to put umpteen amounts of material on the a lot of this cultural material I've tried to keep it tightly reined in terms of material that's directly related to the mythological and historical issues that are uh, the data points that the creationists are tripping over. And then, of course, I cross connect it with Egypt, um, the uh, genetic data of which there's just like every month there's a bunch of new papers that are popping up on the, the Neolithic world and connecting the dots as to um, they can trace the genetic haplotypes, which is flat out contradicting that worldview that you get with Nathaniel Jensen and uh, Jeffrey Tompkins and Robert Carter uh, trying to defend that young earth creationist flood model stuff. And of course, Dan Stern Cardinale and Zach Hancock and others have been doing all sorts of analyses to explain why that's claptrap. And we'll be citing a lot of that in the technical literature uh, in the uh, course of the new book. So it should be a gold mine of material that will be as up to date for the publication there as the first book was for the 2020 publication date. So everybody get the books and um, uh, tell everybody about them. And if um, you can become a patron to the project, um, I won't say no. I, I, every uh, thing's, oh, and speaking of which, we need to put up our um, 
uh, thank you notes for our uh, patrons. Silly me, I need to remind everybody that all of this is excessively important. Colleagues and researchers and assistant researchers and friends and then the legacy patrons that helped over various times, it's all made a difference. And um, I can be envious of those ones who are more monetized to where they can do um, uh, the um, uh, on the fly uh, video donations on their lectures. I'm not at that level and probably never will be. Uh, this is after all just a talking head uh, here. I'm sitting here in my den. Uh, I'm not doing razzle dazzle um, intercuts to uh, videos and graphics and the like that you see on the higher echelon people like uh, dear Erica and that. So I've got to uh, plug along as best I can. But we do have our little commercial for the rocks were there that Peter created. And we know it is also bloody noisy. So uh, that's the way that goes. So I will shut off my mouth whilst I play that cute thing. And as usual, I, once I do the final links on everything, uh, the links to all the books and to the Patreon account and to the website are in every single uh, it, um, video. So it's not a hassle to get to. Just click, whoop, and away we go. So that's pretty close to uh, a full hour, 47 minutes. Um, everybody take care uh, in, uh, with all the weather mess that people are having in various spots and all the difficulties that certain spots in the world are happening, all the rest. Um, uh, take care, and uh, we will see you kids all next week. Uh, there may be a thing at the end of the month around in Easter when I'm over with my uh, niece for um, Easter. Uh, whether or not I'll be doing a show on that weekend, I'll see. So that's kind of an iffy uh, cross fingers question mark. We'll cross that bridge when we get around to it. But other than that, we will plowing along week by week. So everybody take care. Uh, Keep an eye out for wooden penguins and we will see you all next week.